glad to see you all here and hold your questions until that time. Nani Darwish was born in Cairo, Egypt, and later raised in the Gaza Strip. In the 1950s, Egypt occupied Gaza, and Gamal Abdel Nasser, who later became Egypt's president, appointed her father to lead the Fadayim guerrilla operations, whose sole mission was to destroy Israel. As Nasser rallied the Arab world to wipe out up in an environment of intense hatred, Nani witnessed firsthand the death and destruction Fadayim operations caused. By attending Gaza elementary schools, she and her siblings were indoctrinated in anti-Semitism at an early age. In 1956, when Nani was eight, her father was assassinated by the Israel Defense Forces. He became a national hero and a symbol for the resistance against Israel. Nani believes the culture of hatred and jihad caused his death. As a young girl, she began to question the society and traditions in which she had been raised. After moving to the United States, Nani increasingly began to realize the extent and impact of the indoctrination of her formative years in Gaza and Egypt. D despite the risks to her own personal safety, Nani decided she had to speak out. As a mother and a proud Arab woman, she decided she didn't want to see future generations of Arab children programmed to hate and be intolerant. Nani's message is not about disloyalty, but love for her culture of origin. She blames Arab leadership and the media for the endless <coughs> rage and violence of the Arab street. Nani is the mother of three children. She is a freelance writer, public speaker, and an interpreter. Her articles have been published in the U.S. and international media, and she lectures regularly, bringing her positive message and call for change to audiences across the country. This is Nani's second time speaking at Virginia Tech after being brought in 2007, and we're so glad to have her today. So please help me in welcoming Miss Nani Darwish. Thank you for being here this lovely evening. I didn't expect Virginia to be in such nice weather, like California, where I come from. Um, I want to start by introducing myself by uh, just telling you that it's not, uh, most people are not comfortable with the discussion of religion, any religion. Because religion is really a personal relationship with God. And each person, uh, you know, relates to God in a different way. And religion by its nature is not something that I really want to talk about. But <clears throat> if religion, uh, starts uh, if, if religion becomes political, if religion aspires to control government, if religion wants to control aspect of life of people, of individuals, then that religion has opened itself to criticism. And there is no need for anybody to be offended. So, if you are offended that Islam is being discussed, it's not fair because under Islamic law, I'm supposed to be killed today. And really, truly, I cannot visit any Islamic country today because under Islamic law, the laws of that religion uh, actually condemn me to death. So I think that gives me the right to speak. I hope you understand. Okay? So, no religion or any ideology in our system in America, is there any ideology or religion that should be above criticism? Please tell me, if, if anybody here believes that there is a religion, intrinsic, by its own nature, has a right not to be criticized, raise your hand and tell me. Any ideology above criticism, communism, capitalism, you name it, religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever. If this ideology or religion is above criticism, tell me that. And then I'll sit down and never speak again. If you can convince me that it's above, it should be above criticism. So I hope we agree that number one, I am not criticizing people. When you criticize a religion, you are not criticizing people. 
or individuals. If you criticize Nazism, you're not criticizing all German people. If you're criticizing communism, you're not criticizing all Russian people. When you're criticizing uh, capitalism or the American political system, you're not criticizing all American people. And the same thing with Islam. So if I criticize Islam, it doesn't mean that I'm calling all Muslims are this or that. And this is not even logical. It's not even, uh, you know, any intelligent person should, should, should understand that you discuss an ideology, you're not discussing the people. So I hope we agree on that. Because at the end of every speech I give, I get a question at the end. So are you calling all Muslim terrorists? And I, I never said that. Of course not. In fact, my family in Egypt are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Some of the most generous people and nicest people you'll ever meet. So I please, I don't take my words of criticizing an ideology, a legal system called Sharia, and make it appear I'm criticizing individuals. I'm really stressing. Okay. <clears throat> so it, it really makes perfect sense that to criticize religion, especially if that religion has a legal system, it has a legal system, and then any legal system, it means it has to be practiced by the government. What is a legal system of Sharia? Why, why is there something called Sharia in Islam? Sharia is created so the Islamic State applies Sharia, and it has to apply Sharia. So if you are uh, living under Sharia like I did, then you will understand under Islam, under the laws of Sharia itself, you are prohibited from discussing whether Sharia is good or bad. Only in America are we allowed to discuss if Sharia is good or bad. Thank you, because I lived under Sharia. So, so I hope this is this explains my position. Like Elizabeth said, I was born and raised as a Muslim in Cairo, Egypt, and I grew up as a child in the 50s in the Gaza Strip. At that time, the Gaza Strip was ruled by Egypt. The West Bank was ruled by Jordan. The job of the whole Arab world, really, it was the policy, it's still the policy of the Arab League, is to destroy <coughs> Israel. And that was before the 67 war. And the mission of all the Arab armies was to destroy Israel. And my father headed the Egyptian military intelligence in Gaza. And his job was to destroy Israel. He used to send uh, men. They did at that, they, their name at that time was, was called the Fida'i. The Fida'i. Fida, Fida'i means a man who self-sacrifices for the bigger jihad, for the goals of Islam. That is the fidei. And I, I was a child. I lived under bombing. I heard when you live from birth under bombing and under, uh, in, in, in a really a war zone, Gaza until today is a war zone, and it was a war zone. War becomes normal to a child. I, I grew up hearing bombs, and all I did at night was run under my bed, thinking it's going to protect me. So I lived really in the heart of the Arab Israeli conflict. I went to Gaza elementary schools, and he told us that Jews want to kill Arab children. They want to kill, uh, they kill Arab women, even to check if she's pregnant if she's pregnant with a boy or a girl. <clears throat> so as a child, when you hear that about any group of people, hatred comes easy. 
terrorism becomes acceptable, who wouldn't want to terrorize a monster? The Jews were monsters, and we all wanted to, to terrorize them. That was, and that's how we saw the world, because we were told that they wanted to kill us. My father was assassinated by Israel to end the jihad. At that time, I was an anti semite I hated the Jews, even though I've never seen them. But I was scared of them. I thought they were monsters. And this is how Arab kids are brought up. This is the condition <coughs> under which Arab kids are brought up. It's trauma. It's drama and hatred to whole groups of people who are called enemies of Allah. This word is everywhere, enemies of Allah. The Jews, the Kafir, that's all the servants were about them in the mosques. It's unbelievable for a Western mind to, to think that on Friday sermon in the mosque, imagine if in your church every Sunday your Christian preacher or your um, in, in, in the rabbi would say, kill non-Jews or kill non-Muslims, non-Christians, because this is your duty as a, as a Christian or as a Jew. This was what I grew up with. You have to kill enemies of Allah. This is, this is what I grew up with. This is, what, this is why what's happening today is happening today. We have created several generations of people who are living on hate. Do you think the people who are killing now in the Middle East are just born killers like that? No. They are standing in front of people with bending them to, to behead them. And they truly believe they are enemies of Allah. It's, this kind of indoctrination can work on the, on the heart of people. These killers are not born like that. They've been indoctrinated. And I was indoctrinated in the same way. So I'm a product of Islamic trauma, of life under tyranny and under an Islamic law called Sharia that is oppressive, especially on women and on non-Muslims. Any minority who is not a Muslim is legally discriminated against. In America, we're all under the law equal. When the tire hits the road, it's the legal system that makes the difference. The legal system in every country is of your final protection. Under Islamic law, the legal system is against you if you're a minority. And you're at the mercy of people who, if they are nice, will treat you good, and if they are not nice, they won't. Because the legal system is against you. Same thing with women. Under the law, there is a set of laws protecting women different from a set of laws protecting men. And the sets of laws protecting women are a lot, uh, a lot less protective, let's put it this way, than men. And that is, for instance, in America, if a woman is beaten by her husband and she picks up the phone and she calls 911, the police will come and protect her, take her away, and, and uh, put the, arrest the man and check if her words were true at least. In the Middle East, if a woman is beaten, it's within the rights the legal right of the husband. She is not protected. In fact, I will quote you the law. 
it's within the right of a man to beat his wife. And the police does not have the right to ask him why. So this is the legal system I'm talking about. Do you think it's, it's a bad idea to talk about this legal system? I shouldn't, I'm overstepping my bounds here. I'm really become, I'm really hurting people by, by relaying to you that there is a legal system that will allow others to beat me. I hope not. I hope, no, hope you're not that sensitive. So, on 9-11, America had a taste of Islamic terror and tyranny. It had a taste of the kind of trauma Islamic terrorism can inflict on humans. Terrorism does not only work on individuals. Terrorism works on nations. No one is discussing how far this trauma has affected the American people. Nobody cares how long it never affected the American people. Did the American people suffer trauma after 9-11 as a nation? Did anybody think about that? Are we sympathetic to the American people? who lost loved ones, 3,000 of them, on 9-11, and the horror of the rest of the nation looking at their fellow citizens jumping from buildings. What a lot of people think about that. I think we have failed the American people after that. We have not given the American people enough right and time to mourn over what happened to them as a nation on 9-11. Terror works on the psyche of individuals and of, of the psyche of nations. And Muslims, since the dawn of history, understood this. Islamic ideology and Islamic preaching advocates terrorism. And it's not useful for us to deny that. The prophet of Islam himself said the following, I have been victorious through terror. This is a quote by Muhammad. Why should we deny the truth? The word Terror is in Arabic, irhab. It calls, it's called irhab, terror. And it's often mentioned in the Quran as a means of treating other people. Please Google it. Check how many times the word terror was mentioned in the Quran and read it in the context of what is written. Do your homework. So, for instance, there's a Quran verse that says, and strike terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. Who are the unbelievers? Anybody who's not a true Muslim. We in the West have a lot to lose if we don't question the ideology that brought us 9-11. We, the problem is a lot more than ISIS. A lot of people, okay, ISIS didn't exist before four years ago, maybe. It didn't exist, but now it hasn't existed. Before that, it was Al-Qaeda. Before Al-Qaeda, it was the Muslim Brotherhood, and so on and so forth. Right now, there's maybe a hundred uh, terror, terror, Islamic terror groups around the world. And everybody tells us, don't worry, these are not really Muslims. 
and you're supposed to believe it, and anybody who says otherwise is a hateful, bad person. Let me give you a quotation from a, the most well-respected Islamic scholar of the 20th century. This scholar, his name is Abu al-Ala al-Mawdudi. Abu al-Ala al-Mawdudi. And this is what he said about the goals of Islam in the world. Quote, Islam wishes to destroy all states and all governments anywhere on the face of the earth, which are opposed to the ideology and program of Islam. So if you are not ruling your country by Sharia law, by Islam, you are a target of, of this. The purpose of Islam is to set up a state on the basis of its own ideology and program. The objective of Islamic Jihad, objective of Islamic Jihad, is to eliminate the rule of an un-Islamic system and establish instead an Islamic system of state rule. Islam does not intend to confine this revolution to a single state, but to bring about a universal revolution. And that universal revolution is going to be called the Caliphate. And it's already started under ISIS. This is not my work, ladies and gentlemen. This is the most revered, the most respected, Islamic scholar of the 20th century, Shir uh, Abu al-Ala in Okay? Let's go to the subject of Islam and government. Why do you think we have all these revolutions constantly in the Middle East? Do you think because Muslim people just like revolutions by nature? No. The reason there are constant revolutions in the Middle East it's because there is a constant power struggle over rule of government by the Islamists. Islam must control government. And this is what Abu al-Ala al-Mawduji said again about this topic of government and Islam. Islam is a revolutionary faith that um, that came to destroy any government made by man. So any man-made government is the goal of Islam is to destroy it. Any nation or power in this world that tries to get in the way of that goal of turning your government into an Islamic government, Islam will fight and destroy. This is not quote, a quotation from Nani Darwish. This is a quotation from the number one Islamic scholar that all Muslims read daily in all mosques and in all Islamic schools. Maududi then he went on to describe what is the Islamic state. That's what we're fighting. ISIS is the Islamic state. It's a new the, the colonel of the Islamic State and is doing terrorism all over the world. So this is what an Islamic State is in the eyes of uh, Islamic textbooks and Maudu. Again, it seeks to mold every aspect of life and of it. So your personal life is not yours. Under the Islamic State, every action you do Every aspect of your life and your activity is, is a right to, by the Islamic State to interfere, to stop it. In such a state, no one can regard any field of his affairs as personal or private. No more private behavior. Okay? 
He then went on to say such a state should be run only by those who believe in the ideology on which it is based and based on the divine law, which is Sharia law, the administrators of the Islamic state, the leaders of the Islamic state, must be those whose life is devoted to the observance and enforcement of that Sharia law. So, an Islamic state is supposed to be ruled by a Muslim devoted to Sharia law. Jihad is the job number one of the Islamic rule. A Muslim head of state, his job is already given to him in the Islamics. He's not free to rule according to his political party, whether it's Democrat or Republic. No, no, no. A Muslim head of state is supposed to rule by one party only. And what's this one party? Hezbollah. What's Hezbollah? It's the party of Allah. It's Sharia. There is nothing called different parties. There is nothing called different, different political systems, different views. I want to be a little bit more conservative. I want to be a little bit more liberal. I want to give individual freedoms. No control government. More government control, no less government control, no this or that. No debate about that. No more. Your problem is solved. You have only one thing to do. You have to all follow Sharia law. And so nothing is personal, nothing is private, and the Muslim head of state must rule by Sharia law. What is the number one duty of a Muslim head of state? It's to preserve Sharia in the same form it was created and reject any novelty. Under the Islamic State gives the job of the Islam the leader. It gives it his job. He has he has to follow it. And his job is to preserve Sharia as it was from the very beginning preserve it as is and reject any novelty, any new idea has to be rejected. What is a new idea that an Islamic leader will bring? Can you give me an idea that, that I'll give you an idea. For instance, the idea of peace with Israel. If a, a Muslim head of state decides to have peace with Israel, what happens? He would have committed a crime against Sharia and violated the duties of his position as a Muslim leader. And he must be taken out of office or assassinated. That's what happened to Anwar Sadat. It was not your generation, but Anwar Sadat had a peace treaty with Israel and was assassinated for it. A lot of people don't know why he was assassinated. He was assassinated very simply because he violated Sharia law, which forbids him to do any, any peace with the enemies of Allah. The enemies of Allah cannot, you cannot have peace, permanent peace with them. To make it easy on the people to reject leaders who violate Sharia to make it easy. Sharia law created a law for the people to rise and assassinate their leader if he is, if he violates Sharia. Can you believe that? There is a law under Sharia that says clearly a Muslim head of state that does not rule by Sharia has to be removed from office. He has to be removed from office. There is another law that facilitates that. Under Sharia, there are three ways of coming to power. 
for a leader to come to power in the Islamic State, there are three ways to do it. None of them, by the way, is through elections. The first way is to, for the leaders, the leadership to put on them, just like the Khomeini's or like uh, Saudi Arabia. The, the king and, and, the, and the princess, and they pick one among them. That's one way. A second way is you can come to power through seizure of power, meaning through force. That is a quote. Under Islam, you can come to power through seizure of power, meaning through force. So when you find a, a coup d'etat in an Arab country, and the leader is put in jail or assassinated. That's perfectly within Islam. And the whole population celebrates the new, the new leader. It's not illegal. In America, it would be illegal. Let's say you're a, a Democrat, you don't like a Republican, or a Republican, you don't like a Democrat. But you cannot, in America, go and have a a coup d'etat and assassinated, and the whole country celebrates the next day. And that's what I grew up on. That's what I grew up on. And nobody questions the legality. And that's perfectly legal under Sharia. So this is the kind of law that you are afraid to discuss in details. I'm just telling you because you consider Discussing Sharia is something that's very, you know, you, you don't, we don't like to discuss other people's culture because it will hurt their feelings, but you have to know what you're buying. So you, to, to have a legal system that allows the, 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 the assumption of, of power through seizure of power, meaning through force, is illegal in Western uh, Political system, but it's perfectly legal under under Islamic law, and that's why they all have revolutions all the time. A country like Egypt, Egypt had the 1919 revolution, a 1952 revolution, and in between many assassinations and uh, toppling of governments. A 2011 revolution, a 2013 counter revolution in Egypt, and now, even now, there are people conspiring to have another counter counter revolution against Sisi. You will never have political stability under the Islamic Sharia system unless you become a tyrant. because everybody is stabbing the other in the back. Claiming they have violated the Sharia, they have to be removed from office. That's what they're saying about Sisi right now. That's why the, <coughs> under the Arabian, there is something called the Arabian Peninsula, the Qada of the Arabian Peninsula, there is a king. They want to topple the, the king of, the, of Saudi Arabia today. They don't think he is Islamic enough. <laughs> this is the truth. So the, 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 the political instability that comes as a, as a result of Sharia is, is unbelievable for your, your imagination. And so the objectives of the Islamic State, let's say ISIS wins. Let's say ISIS wins, and it wins over all the Islamic countries. And suddenly everybody says, it's OK. They were not bad after all. Let's form our Islamic State. That state is going to be a threat to every non-Muslim nation in the world. Why? Here again is a statement about the objectives of the Islamic State. By Maududi again. 
The objective of the Islamic Jihad is to eliminate the rule of an un-Islamic system, which is America, Israel, European countries, and establish in its place an Islamic system of state rule. State rule. Islam wishes to, to do away with all states and governments which are opposed to the ideology and program of Islam. It's over and over and over again, stated all of Islamic books of Sharia. And I'm here to tell you, these are not words that I created, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you the truth. Actually, Maududi said that he said also that he has to put an end to the sovereignty and supremacy of the unbelievers, non-Muslims. Non-Muslims in his book should not rule over themselves. And that's why there is the idea of the din, ahl din, din. The Adini ideology is Okay, if you don't want to become Muslim, we we'll allow you to live, but never by under your own rule. You have to live under Islamic rule as a second class citizen. And this is, these are the, the, the values of how they view non-Muslims. So you should never be able to rule over yourself if you're non-Muslim under Islamic law. You're not a Muslim, you cannot rule over yourself. Even if you're a majority population. Actually, recently, there's a village in Upper Egypt, a village uh, that's predominantly Coptic Christian. And they voted in a mayor for them who's Coptic Christian. And the government in Cairo uh, turned him down. Because according to Sharia, they cannot be ruled by their own religion, the Christians. Cannot. So I'm just telling you what's in the books. That's all I'm saying. And the duties of the Muslim head of state is to abide by that. Any Muslim head of state who does not abide by that has to be taken out of office, and that's why they fix that. And that's why a lot of people don't understand why Arab leaders are have double. The way they speak is just crazy. They don't understand why. They speak to Western media, they say one thing, they go to their people and they say something else. And a lot of people think, are they crazy or are they, uh, why are they doing it? But the reason they're doing that is because they want to stay alive. They talk to the West, they talk according, they abide by international law. They say things that, uh, that abide by international law. They go to their people, they say jihad, jihad, kill them. Because they have to abide by Sharia. And there is no way to be one person. A Muslim head of state cannot be one person in front of the whole world. They can't. He cannot go and speak to the United Nations and to the leaders of the Western world and say one thing and then go to their people and say the same thing. They have to say a different story. It's all because of, Sh of, of Sharia. And Sharia does not only force the Islamic government to be ruled by Sharia. It also forces every individual in the Islamic State for the goals of Sharia, for the goals of Jihad. Do you know why women are oppressed in Muslim? Do you know why the legal system oppresses them? It's very simple, and I discovered, I wrote it in my new book. I have a new book coming out in February. It's called Holy <coughs> Different, Islamic Values Versus Bitcoin. And the reason Islam oppresses women is because men are supposed to be devoted to jihad. And 
and not to love and family, and not to devotion to one another. They must be jihadists. And when you devote your life to jihad, excuse me, I don't like the light in my eye, I'm sorry, can you postpone that for later? The light is in my eye. So it's, it's, that is why the women have to have a specific role in jihad. They have to. Because they have to devote their whole families to jihad. Women are supposed to encourage their husbands to do jihad. Women are supposed to be proud that their sons go to jihad. And you see it on Arab TV a lot. An Arab woman would say, I gave my three kids for jihad, and I want to give the other three to jihad. And everybody claps. Why? Because women's rights are not important. It's jihad that's important. Women have to sacrifice their womanhood for jihad. They have to sacrifice their husbands for jihad. They have to sacrifice their children for jihad. And if they leave nature to do its course, women would want to, to have a, a happy life. They don't want to do jihad. They don't, want, they don't want to go sacrifice their loved ones. But Islamic society rewards women who sacrifice their lives, their children, their husbands to jihad. Why? Because jihad is the number one ob objectives, objective of Islam. It's before men, it's before women, and it's before children. And that's one of the reasons why Islamic society is oppressing of, of women. Without the control of government and Sharia submission of citizens to Sharia, Islam does not feel powerful enough to be accepted. Islam feels powerful only if it controls government. Islam must control governments. And that's why we have all these Arab Springs. For 1,400 years, Islam never produced stable governments. All the Khalifas, all the leaders are constantly coming to office after a coup d'etat or before a coup d'etat, after an assassination or before an, assass an assassination. Why? Because everybody has to rule by Sharia, and those who don't rule 100% by Sharia are assassinated. You can never produce a stable government. Islam has to control government. There's a constant fight over government control in Islamic countries. And that is, the, that is a major problem for Islamic, for Islamic stability. And that is a major reason why you see the Arab Spring. This is the norm. I lived through three revolutions. I lived through assassinations. That's all we lived under in the Middle East. And I would hate to see this in any. I wish that one day I see Arab countries reject this idea that they have to control government. By, by Sharia, because this is the root cause of the problem. But Islamic governments, the minute they control government, because Islam feels it's immune, immune to criticism. Islam says, I'm immune to criticism because I'm a religion. Okay, fine. But the minute you control government, you cannot you cannot be immune from criticism. You cannot eat your cake and have it too. You want to be just a religion and immune from criticism, fine. You can be immune from criticism. If I live in my house, close the door, and worship a rock, who cares? It doesn't, you, do, you don't care. But if you hold that rock and throw it at your neighbors, then 
That's a different story. And that is the problem. Islam was immunity from, from criticism, but at the same time, it was to control government. It was to control the lives of every person, personal life. And you cannot have that. You cannot have immunity from criticism and total control over the lives of people like that. And this is the dilemma of Islam. To put, it, to put it in a nutshell, the dilemma of Islam is that it wants to be immune from criticism and also control government. Western values rely on reason. Your values rely on reason. And you don't, that's why you don't feel criticism. In the West, you actually welcome criticism and you like to debate. And you say, why I'm right, why I'm wrong, why you're right, why you're wrong. And debate is, is the healthy aspect of Western life. Unfortunately, the Muslim world does not have that because of the immunity of Islam to criticism. And the problem is when Islam controls government, like in Iran or Saudi Arabia, it carries with it, Islam carries with it the immunity to criticism to the government. So when the government becomes tyrannical, guess what? You cannot criticize government. This is a big problem because you can't differentiate between Islam and the government in Islamic countries. And you cannot make in government in your criticism. Do you want your government in America to be in your criticism? Well, if you put Sharia in it, it will be. So Islamic Sharia dictates that government and should fall under the total physical control of Islam and Islam. And that is what in Islam is called the caliphate. The caliphate combines the government and the religion, put them together in a nice little package called Sharia, controlled government, the caliphate. And it's immune to criticism. What are you going to do if you live under that? is immune to criticism. Under the Islamic formula of government, escaping from absolute tyranny would then be out of the question. You cannot escape tyranny under this system of government. So the, the caliphate, um, the number one duty in that immune government immune to criticism called the caliphate, the head of state has immunity, immunity from to being called a tyrant. Because he's not ruling by Sharia. So the caliphate is the Islamic community needs a ruler to uphold the religion and to defend the Sunnah. That is the Islamic ruler. He has to uphold the Sunnah and the caliphate. So everything is tied in a knot. You cannot pull them away from each other. So if you live in an Islamic state, you have to worry about the rights of the Islamic state not to be criticized, more than your rights not to be oppressed. Do you get that? If you live it under the Islamic caliphate, you have to worry about the right of the Islamic State not to be criticized more than your right for individual rights and human rights. I'll give you a minute to think about that. So these are these are the issues that I want to alert the West to. Are we going to relinquish the power of government to a, a religious law called Sharia? This is what the caliphate means. In the West, government serves people. 
in the Islamic state, in the caliphate, people serve God. In the West, you're endowed by your creator to serve the inalienable rights. In the Islamic state, you're endowed by your Islamic state, whatever rights they give you. You're endowed by the state, not by your creator, by the Islamic state, by Sharia. Very different. And uh, I'm sure you all have an idea about Sharia. I want to conclude by Sharia that take your questions. I want to give you a, a few examples on some of the legal, the laws of Sharia that you will live under if you live under the caliphate. What are these laws? Give me an example. Just compare, compare these laws to the laws uh, that you live under under the American Constitution. Just use your, your imagination. It's obligatory for a Muslim to lie if the purpose is obligatory. That's a law in Sharia. You're obliged to lie if the purpose is an obligation. Like jihad. Jihad is an obligation. And you must lie to protect you. By the way, this is a new Sharia. Slander and exaggeration are allowed if the purpose is lawful. Jihad defense def defines a war against non-Muslims to establish the religion. What is jihad? A lot of people say it's an inner struggle with self-analysis. Jihad doesn't mean war. Well, let's not take my words or yours words. Right? Let's take the words of uh, uh, the, the largest Islamic university in the world, which is called Al Azhar University in Cairo. You know how it defines jihad? If you go to Al Azhar University in Cairo, this is the definition of jihad a permanent war institutions against Jews, Christians, and Christians. That is the definition of jihad. A caliphah, a khat, a Muslim head of state can hold office through seizure of power. Can you believe that? This is in Sharia. So, uh, you know, people running for office, instead of going for an election, begging and kissing the people's hands to elect them, like we have in America, you can come through seizure of power, meaning through force. A Khalifa is exempt from charges of murder, adultery, robbery, theft, drinking, and in some cases, rape. This is in the Sharia books. They have something called immunity. <coughs> Muhammad himself had immunity, by the way. The prophet of Islam is it's, it's called uh, it has a name. But it's, it's a immunity to sin. You, you, you cannot be called sin in any way if you do anything. And here is another. Can, can the head of the United States, the president, commit crimes and get away with it because he's immune to sin? Is this in your constitution, America? Well, think about it. It's happening across the lake, the other side of the world. This is in the legal system. And all cultures are equal. All religions are equal. And all laws are equal. So why care? I hope not. And so a man-made government, such as democracy, is an abomination and must be eliminated. This is written in, in many, many Islamic books. <coughs> many Muslim leaders say that in mosques. Uh, Khalifa must be Muslim. He must be male. A woman cannot run for office. In Islam, only a man and a Muslim must, must be uh, the ruler. 
So even if a big majority in the country is Christian, they cannot have, a, he cannot run for office. He's prohibited because he's Christian. Now you understand how it feels to be a Coptic Christian in Egypt? They can never run for office. And this is a law that, uh, that applies to me. A Muslim who leaves Islam must be killed immediately. I left Islam and I cannot visit 57 Muslim countries. Because if I visit any of the 57 Muslim countries, I must be killed. Legally, under this wonderful law called Sharia. People say, why, why fear Sharia? Why fear? I am afraid. Because it condemns me to death. Because I, under Islam, I have no right to leave that religion. To be a, to be a Christian or a Jew or an atheist is a right in America. It's not a right in Islam. When you're born, your birth certificate said Muslim. To be a Muslim is a contract with the state that you cannot violate. So these are some of the laws. Blasphemy is, is also, uh, people who do blasphemy are killed. There's a woman in Pakistan, in Pakistan today, a Christian woman, who is waiting, awaiting her killed because some of her neighbors said that she insulted Islam. So you have a religion that's immune to criticism and it's assuming government and it's the control of government. And that's what I'm talking about. And I want to conclude with that I have so much to say, it's just the time and I want to you know give a give you a chance to ask me questions and to communicate with your people. These people who are have objected to me coming to speak here, please, I would like to take your questions first. Can I? Anybody has a question for me, especially those who objected to me? Yes. I don't object to what you say, but I'm just curious. With so much trouble of power coming, um, because we have a right to seize power, uh, how do you think that reform can ever occur? Excellent question. How, the question is, how can you have reform if, uh, if there's this constant struggle of power over the government between Islam and people who don't want to, Islam to be in the government? And that's what's happening in almost all Islamic countries today, is between, sometimes between the military and the Islamists. The turban-headed people and the military people. Usually these are the people fighting over government power in most, in most Islamic countries. It's, the, it's a fight, and this is a fight that no one else can join. You cannot get a party of humanitarians, let's say, in the middle. They discord. So it's the power of the military and the power of people who the, the religious people who can issue fatwas of them. Their power lies in their ability to issue fatwas of death. That's it. They can sit in their, in their huge mosques and say, this person has committed a crime against Islam, <coughs> and they have left Islam and by death, and that's, thus they, they have become an apostate. And that's their power. Their power is to condemn people to death. And that is why you're very right. Muslim countries, even during the caliphate, the transmission of power was never peaceful. Was never peaceful. There was never a shakedown between the, old, the older uh, uh, government and the new country. It was always either inherited or through assassination and most of the caliphs of the Islamic caliphates, they were assassinated. If you look at the history of Islam, it's been bloody from day one. Even after Muhammad died, his grandson, Ali, 
wanted to assume the power, and then this, he, he was in a, a war, a war uh, with, with other leaders uh, with, of Muhammad, until they assassinated Ali, the grandson of Muhammad. So there is no formula for peaceful transmission of power in Islam, unfortunately. And the solution? The solution is in the hands of God, really. I don't know uh, if this is easily solved, and that's why it's not, it's not an easy solution. Uh, to have a, a true democracy like in the United States is such a miracle. To look at, even, even at the worst time when you see Hillary and Trump, I mean, hitting each other, but at the end, I have no doubt they will shake hands and transmit the power of peace. And that is the miracle of the United States compared to three quarters of the world undergo a change of leadership through violence. It's not just Islamic countries. Many, many third world countries are like that. Many countries in South America, in Africa, well, all of Islamic countries. I mean, there was a coup recently against the president of Turkey. Yes, Turkey is the most supposedly the most modern and westernized Islamic country. And even that country was about to have a coup d'etat recently. So you've asked me a question I really don't have a, an answer to. I'm sorry. That is a big problem for Islam. Yes? Yes, sir. So, uh, my name is Tarek and I am the president of the Islamic Society of Nurebor Valley. So, uh, this is one of the unaccurate uh, species on any topic I ever heard in my life. A Muslim can never lie. Can never lie, a Muslim, unless his life is under a threat. So, if it's for his benefit, okay, he cannot lie. If it's please, for his benefit, he cannot question, lie. Ask a question, please. Don't give a lecture. So, no, 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 no. You're, no, no. You're, you're here. You're here falsifying. No. You're here falsifying no, you're facts. Not I'm not telling you. I do have a question. I do have a question for you. Justify, justify for me. Justify for me why. Justify for me why there are more Christians living in the Middle East among the Arabs and the Muslims than the Muslims who are living in America. There are 10 million Christian Egyptians living in Egypt. Justify that for me. That's a good question. Thank you. Egypt, in the 7th century, used to be a Christian nation. All of Egypt, not 10%. All of Egypt belonged to the, uh, to the Byzantine. What is the Byzantine Empire? It was the Christian, the first Christian empire in the world, before Western Europe was Christian. Before America was Christian, Egypt was Christian. Turkey was Christian, 100%. And in a certain period of Egyptian history, in the seventh century, <coughs> certain weak period of Egyptian history, Arabs from Arabia conquered the whole area. It conquered Egypt. And and how, 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 Egypt how Egypt became a Christian? Egypt was born a Christian? You want to go to the original? Uh, well, the uh, ancient Egyptians, ancient Egyptians used to be you can, hear, you can hear the, the bells of the churches in the middle of Cairo, but you can never hear the call for a prayer, Muslim prayer, that's, in any city in America, I don't hear that or in a... any city in the United ah, States. Okay. You can hear the bells of the churches in the Middle East, but you cannot you hear the Adan, the most Adan here. I don't want to hear. No, no, I don't no, want to hear. I, I'm anyway, sorry. I, I got everything I, on record, and I think I don't want to hear ever the call of the Adan. In public, this is a private matter. Why, why force people to hear it? I was in Israel and I heard it again by force 
on uh, in Jerusalem. And, uh, and nobody rings bells for uh, here and, and wake people up at 6 a.m. like a death. Um, so any other question? Because I don't think that his question was logical. I would like to start by apologizing for the eye behavior. I'm a Muslim myself, but I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't just try to write to But I have just have a couple of questions for you. Sure. So, uh, you said that in Muslim, uh, there's a Sharia law that justifies killing, that uh, like, we call the infidel, and you justify the killing of gay people and all this stuff. I don't condone this stuff, I don't agree with it, but I also found, but I, I also found that the same is like, type of uh, script and verse it in the Quran in the Bible too. I, I can I have them on my phone and I would like to say that if not we are we all my Christian and Muslim we, we have similar values. And just uh, I'm a Muslim myself. The question is the question is uh, why, why is Islam different than Christian when we all have the same uh we should have killing uh justifying of killing gays and justifying of killing uh, Okay. So you think that Islamic values and biblical values are the same? No, I don't think they're the same. They are similar. Okay. Do you have a law in a law? I'm talking law. I'm not talking opinions. Law is very different from opinion. Do you have a law in America or in any church or in any Biblical institution, Jewish or Christian, a law that says the following, and I'm going to quote A Christian will not be prosecuted for killing an apostate from Christianity. Do you have a law? Do you have a law in America that says a Christian or a Jew who kills their own people, who leave Christianity or leave Judaism? That person will not be prosecuted or, or arrested if he kills an apostate. Do you have a law in America? Yes. But, uh, yes? That, that, yes? No, no, no. I'm saying, no, no, I'm saying like what you said before is yes, but oh, okay. I'm talking. Okay. I'm okay. saying that. You're a student here? No, no, I, I'm talking about I mean, I'm, I'm talking about law here. No. Law. Okay. Of no, 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 no. I'm not talking about separation of church and state. I'm talking about a religious law. We have the Ten Commandments, okay? Is there an eleventh commandment that says a Jew or a Christian will uh, will not be prosecuted, arrested, and prosecuted if they kill a pastor? We don't have it. In Islam, we have it. There is a law in Sharia. And when I say a law, it doesn't mean opinions here. Please understand. A law is a, is a very different thing from just a storytelling or opinions. A law is a legal code that is written in the constitution of governments. Okay? Sharia law is written in the constitution of Islamic governments. I don't agree with that. I believe we should. Okay, I don't care about what you agree. I care about what's written in the constitution. I'm sorry. When I go to Egypt and I get killed, and the person who kills me is killed a, 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 a great person, I'm not going to come to you, okay, to save me. So please don't tell me my opinion. Your opinion and my opinion are nothing. My opinion is nothing. I'm not here saying my opinion, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is under the Western system, there are no laws to protect people who kill apostates. No laws. In Islam, every Muslim country has a law that protects people who kill apostates, okay? That's the difference I'm talking Yes? How did you overcome, like, growing up being taught to hate Jews and Christians? Very hard. It wasn't easy. A lot of people ask me that question. It's a very good question. How come, how come I overcame?
came all this education. And I used to be an anti Semite. Do you think I was like that from the very beginning? No. It took me years to de uh, like program myself. It wasn't easy. And I went through a lot of trauma in my life, and I went through many years of overcoming trauma. And I am doing this because I love this country. Because as a woman, I got my dignity and my freedom and my feeling of being a human being in this country. And that's what I'm saying. And by the way, I really want to tell you something. I love the Arab I love the Muslim people. My whole family in Egypt are Muslim. They don't speak to me anymore because I, I, I say what I say. They are some of the most wonderful people. Oppressed people are a lot of time very nice people, you know. And I have no, no doubt that you have one of the nicest families I have ever known. Because I know that Islamic culture produces people who comply, who want to bring up the kids well. There is a lot of virtues in Islamic culture. And when I speak about the negatives, it doesn't mean that everybody is is a terrorist, like I like they say, of course not. I mean, really, uh, some of the most wonderful people I know are Muslims. So it's not the people in the rituals. And I have no doubt that this young man here will stand in front of me and, and protect me if I go to Egypt and I get here. I have no doubt in his decency and his sincerity. I have no doubt. Please don't, uh, don't think that I am here for any reason but to speak about big ideologies that are controlling the people and laws that are uh, that hurt them. That's what I'm talking about. That's why we have governments that are oppressing people. That's why we have people killing people in the Middle East. I don't want this to happen everywhere. That's my motivation. Any other question? Yes. So, uh, thank you, first of all, for coming to speak with us. So, uh, how do you think uh, modern Muslims can uh, can combat uh, Sharia law and uh, push back against them? That's a very good question. About how can Muslims deal with Sharia law? How can a good Muslim do this Sharia law? And well, from what I see is that the good Muslims who are the majority, they are not denying. They tell you Sharia law, the interpretation of Sharia law really depends on how we look at it. And I don't agree to it. And, uh, and really, if you look at the Arab countries, that's what they say. If you look at Arab countries, you find so many differences and so many deviations. So, yeah, Saudi Arabia is a bit radical. But look at the women here and there, there. And it will convince you that it's all a matter of opinion. That law does not mean law. And law means law. Frankly, I could not live in any Islamic country because I cannot deal with it. It's in a place. Whenever. whenever you go to a courthouse and you're a woman, in a courthouse in Islamic countries, you will lose. But guess how many women file lawsuits against men? Practically zero because they lose. And that is the problem. I'm not talking about the wives of rich shades who are powerful. I'm not talking about them. I'm not talking about the educated Muslim women who are very impressive and very articulate. Very. I'm not talking about them. There is a large number of very, very successful Muslim women 
my sis, my family has physicists, women physicists, but she's here in America because she wants her, food, her social food. <coughs> physicists, doctors, engineers, women, Muslim women. Many of them are non -practice. But if you live under the umbrella of Islam, and Islamic law, you cannot avoid but being taken by this uh, tornado called Sharia law. It's a hit and miss. And you might miss and you might be hit by, by Sharia law. It depends on your circumstances. But this is the legal system you live under. And you cannot avoid it. When push comes to shove and you go to court as a woman, you don't know, if you go to court as a Christian, I hope I didn't depress you. <laughs> there is hope. Life was never made perfect. Islam was an experiment that came as a rejection of life 600 years after. 600 years after the Bible, the values of the Bible, which is Western values. Islam came as a rejection. And he has stated that it's the opposite, opposite to them. And there's a struggle between them, between it's like the yin and the yang. It's up to you to pick which side you want. That's all I'm talking about. And it's all in God's hand. What, what is going to happen in the future, in America, in the Middle East? We don't know. The passage of time is not necessarily a guarantee for positive progress. Sometimes the passage of time brings us negative progress. Progress that we never asked for or wanted. This is how the world we live in it is made. And sometimes things are beyond our, our hands. And some things appear as good and it's really not very good. So I'm just telling you what the facts are in Sharia, in Islamic countries. And because this idea about we can't talk about Islam, otherwise we are going to offend people, that's what I'm talking about. That no religion, no ideology is beyond the question. That's, that's all. It's up to you guys. You're the future. You're the next generation. Uh, it's it really, I, I, I just, when I look at young people like you, it's very inspiring. Uh, I'm really honored, blessed to be here today. Thank you so much. <laughs>